At certain periods it becomes the dearest ambition of a man to keep a faithful record of his performances in a book. And he dashes at his work with an enthusiasm that imposes on him the notion that keeping a journal is the veriest pastime in the world, and the pleasantest. But if he only lives twenty-one days, he will find out that only those rare natures that are made up of pluck, endurance, devotion to duty for duty's sake, and invincible determination, may hope to venture upon so tremendous an enterprise as the keeping of a journal and not sustain a shameful defeat. If you wish to inflict a heartless and malignant punishment upon a young person, pledge him to keep a journal a year. The Quaker City in a Storm And the last night of the seven was the stormiest of all. There was no thunder, no noise, but the pounding bows of the ship, the keen whistling of the gale through the cordage, and the rush of the seething waters. But the vessel climbed aloft, as if she would climb to heaven, then paused an instant that seemed a century, and plunged headlong down again as from a precipice. The sheeted sprays drenched the decks like rain, the blackness of darkness was everywhere. At long intervals, a flash of lightning clove it with a quivering line of fire that revealed a heaving world of water where was nothing before, kindled the dusky cordage to glittering silver, and lit up the faces of the men with a ghastly luster. Fear drove many on deck that were used to avoiding the night winds and the spray. Some thought the vessel could not live through the night, and it seemed less dreadful to stand out in the midst of the wild tempest and see the peril that threatened than to be shut up in the sepulchral cabins under the dim lamps and imagine the horrors that were abroad on the ocean. And once out, once where they could see the ship struggling in the strong grasp of the storm, once where they could hear the shriek of the winds, and face the driving spray, and look out upon the majestic picture the lightnings disclosed. They were prisoners to a fierce fascination they could not resist, and so remained. While we stood admiring the cloud-capped peaks, and the lowlands robed in misty gloom, a finer picture burst upon us, and chained every eye like a magnet, a stately ship, with canvas piled on canvas, till she was one towering mass of bellying sail. She came speeding over the sea like a great bird. Africa and Spain were forgotten. All homage was for the beautiful stranger. While everybody gazed, she swept superbly by, and flung the stars and stripes to the breeze. Quicker than thought, Hats and handkerchiefs flashed in the air, and a cheer went up. She was beautiful before, she was radiant now. Many a one on her decks knew then for the first time how tame a sight his country's flag is at home compared with what it is in a foreign land. To see it is to see a vision of home itself and all its idols and feel a thrill that would stir a very river of sluggish blood. Tangier What a funny old town it is. It seems like profanation to laugh and jest and bandy the frivolous chat of our day amid its hoary relics. Only the stately phraseology and the measured speech of the sons of the prophet are suited to a venerable antiquity like this. Here is a crumbling wall that was old when Columbus discovered America, was old when Peter the Hermit roused the knightly men of the Middle Ages to arm for the First Crusade, was old when Charlemagne and his paladins beleaguered enchanted castles and battled with giants and genii in the fabled days of the olden time, 
was old when Christ and his disciples walked the earth, stood where it stands today when the lips of Memnon were vocal, and men bought and sold in the streets of ancient Thebes. American Beauties I will conclude this chapter with a remark that I am sincerely proud to be able to make, and glad, as well, that my comrades cordially endorse it, to wit, by far the handsomest women we have seen in France were born and reared in America. I feel, now, like a man who has redeemed a failing reputation, and shed luster upon a dimmed escutcheon, by a single just deed done at the eleventh hour. Let the curtain fall to slow music. An Early Memory It is hard to forget repulsive things. I remember yet how I ran off from school once when I was a boy, and then, pretty late at night, concluded to climb into the window of my father's office and sleep on a lounge, because I had a delicacy about going home and getting thrashed. As I lay on the lounge and my eyes grew accustomed to the darkness, I fancied I could see a long, dusky, shapeless thing stretched upon the floor. A cold shiver went through me. I turned my face to the wall. That did not answer. I was afraid that the thing would creep over and seize me in the dark. I turned back and stared at it for minutes and minutes. They seemed hours. It appeared to me that the lagging moonlight never, never would get to it. I turned to the wall and counted twenty to pass the feverish time away. I looked. The pale square was nearer. I turned again and counted fifty. It was almost touching it. With desperate will I turned again and counted one hundred, and faced about, all in a tremble. A white human hand lay in the moonlight. Such an awful sinking at the heart, such a sudden gasp for breath. I felt, I cannot tell what I felt. When I recovered strength enough, I faced the wall again. But no boy could have remained so, with that mysterious hand behind him. I counted again, and looked. The most of a naked arm was exposed. I put my hands over my eyes, and counted until I could stand it no longer, and then the pallid face of a man was there, with the corners of the mouth drawn down, and the eyes fixed and glassy in death. I raised to a sitting posture and glowered on the corpse till the light crept down the bare breast, line by line, inch by inch, past the nipple, and then it disclosed a ghastly stab. I went away from there. I do not say that I went away in any sort of a hurry, but I simply went. That is sufficient. I went out at the window, and I carried the sash along with me. I did not need the sash, but it was handier to take it than it was to leave it, and so I took it. I was not scared, but I was considerably agitated. When I reached home they whipped me, but I enjoyed it. It seemed perfectly delightful. That man had been stabbed near the office that afternoon and they carried him in there to doctor him, but he only lived an hour. I have slept in the same room with him often, since then, in my dreams. At the Ambrosian Library We saw a manuscript of Virgil, with annotations in the handwriting of Petrarch, the gentleman who loved another man's Laura, and lavished upon her all through life a love which was a clear waste of the raw material. It was sound sentiment, but bad judgment. It brought both parties fame, and created a fountain of commiseration for them in sentimental breasts that is running yet. But who says a word in behalf of poor Mr. Laura? I do not know his other name. 
Who glorifies him? Who bedews him with tears? Who writes poetry about him? Nobody. How do you suppose he liked the state of things that has given the world so much pleasure? Let the world go on fretting about Laura and Petrarch if it will. But as for me, my tears and my lamentations shall be lavished upon the unsung defendant. We saw also an autograph letter of Lucretia Borgia, a lady for whom I have always entertained the highest respect, on account of her rare histrionic capabilities, her opulence in solid gold goblets made of gilded wood, her high distinction as an operatic screamer, and the facility with which she could order a sextuple funeral and get the corpses ready for it. we saw one single coarse yellow hair from Lucretia's head likewise. It awoke emotions, but we still live. In this same library we saw some drawings by Michael Angelo, these Italians call him Michelangelo, and Leonardo da Vinci. They spell it Vinci and pronounce it Vinci. Our Need of Repose just in this one matter lies the main charm of life in Europe, comfort. In America we hurry, which is well, but when the day's work is done, we go on thinking of losses and gains, we plan for the morrow, we even carry our business cares to bed with us, and toss and worry over them when we ought to be restoring our racked bodies and brains with sleep. We burn up our energies with these excitements, and either die early or drop into a lean and mean old age at a time of life which they call a man's prime in Europe. When an acre of ground is produced long and well, we let it lie fallow and rest for a season. We take no man clear across the continent in the same coach he started in. The coach is stabled somewhere on the plains and its heated machinery allowed to cool for a few days. When a razor has seen long service and refuses to hold an edge, the barber lays it away for a few weeks and the edge comes back of its own accord. We bestow thoughtful care upon inanimate objects, but none upon ourselves. What a robust people, what a nation of thinkers we might be, if we would only lay ourselves on the shelf occasionally and renew our edges. I do envy these Europeans the comfort they take. When the work of the day is done, they forget it. It was a long, long ride. But toward evening, as we sat silent and hardly conscious of where we were, subdued into that meditative calm that comes so surely after a conversational storm, someone shouted, Venice! And sure enough, afloat on the placid sea a league away, lay a great city with its towers and domes and steeples drowsing in a golden midst of sunset. The venerable mother of the republics is scarce a fit subject for flippant speech or the idle gossiping of tourists. It seems a sort of sacrilege to disturb the glamour of old romance that pictures her to us softly from afar off as through a tinted mist and curtains her ruin and her desolation from our view. One ought, indeed, to turn away from her rags, her poverty, and her humiliation, and think of her only as she was when she sunk the fleets of Charlemagne, when she humbled Frederick Barbarossa, or waved her victorious banners above the battlements of Constantinople. There was music everywhere, choruses, string bands, brass bands, flutes, everything. I was so surrounded, walled in with music, magnificence, and loveliness, 
that I became inspired with the spirit of the scene and sang one tune myself. However, when I observed that the other gondolas had sailed away and my gondolier was preparing to go overboard, I stopped. In the glare of the day, there is little poetry about Venice, but under the charitable moon, her stained palaces are white again, their battered sculptures are hidden in shadows, and the old city seems crowned once more with the grandeur that was hers 500 years ago. It is easy then, in fancy, to people these silent canals with plumed gallants and fair ladies, with Shylocks in gabardine and sandals, venturing loans upon the rich argosies of Venetian commerce, with Othellos and Desdemonas, with Iagos and Rodrigos, with noble fleets and victorious legions returning from the wars. In the treacherous sunlight, we see Venice decayed, forlorn, poverty-stricken, and commerceless, forgotten and utterly insignificant. But in the moonlight, her 14 centuries of greatness fling their glories about her, and once more, she is the princeliest among the nations of the earth. Yes, I think we have seen all Venice. We have seen in these old churches a profusion of costly and elaborate sepulchre ornamentation such as we never dreamt of before. We have stood in the dim religious light of these hoary sanctuaries, in the midst of long ranks of dusty monuments and effigies, of the great dead of Venice, until we seemed drifting back, 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 into the solemn past, and looking upon the scenes and mingling with the people of a remote antiquity. We have been in a half-waking sort of a dream all the time. I do not know how else to describe the feeling. A part of our being has remained still in the nineteenth century, while another part of it has seemed in some unaccountable way walking among the phantoms of the tenth. We have seen famous pictures until our eyes are weary with looking at them and refuse to find interest in them any longer. We have striven hard to learn. We have had some success. We have mastered some things, possibly of trifling import, in the eyes of the learned. But to us they give pleasure, and we take as much pride in our little acquirements as do others who have learned far more, and we love to display them full as well. When we see a monk going about with a lion and looking tranquilly up to heaven, we know that that is St. Mark. When we see a monk with a book and a pen looking tranquilly up to heaven, trying to think of a word, we know that that is St. Matthew. When we see a monk sitting on a rock, looking tranquilly up to heaven, with a human skull beside him, and without other baggage, we know that that is St. Jerome. Because we know that he always went flying light in the matter of baggage. When we see a party looking tranquilly up to heaven, unconscious that his body is shot through and through with arrows, we know that that is St. Sebastian. When we see other monks looking tranquilly up to heaven, but having no trademark, we always ask who those parties are. We do this because we humbly wish to learn. And so, having satisfied ourselves, we depart tomorrow, and leave the venerable Queen of the Republics to summon her vanished ships, and marshal her shadowy armies, and know again in dreams the pride of her old renown.